The good old clap, take one. That's right. How many of you knew what you wanted to be when you were seven years old? I did. I wanted to be a world champion. Hey, is there honesty involved in this podcast? Can we be honest? You can shut your fucking lips. And then I'll just say, put them up once. Let's go. He's like, you look too pretty on the wave. Get ugly. We can talk about DMT if you want. Let's talk to your boxes. All right, we have 2021, I guess. 2020, 2021, championship tour rookie, Isabella Nichols on the lineup. Izzy, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And, and you're you're leading the rookie of the year battle at the moment. I mean, coming into the year, it wasn't really a hard task because I was the only rookie on tour. Of course. Um, but now it's cool. I've got Amuro on there. So um, I'm not sure how that works in regards to because she's an injury replacement or whatnot, sure. if she can, like claim rookie of the year but it's nice i've got that little like rivalry going on now but um yeah it's fun for a tour that was i mean on my side it's felt very inconsistent but to the outside it's probably been pretty static for a long time what a bizarre time to be a rookie right it's um definitely interesting and not how i pictured my first year on tour would go but to be totally honest with you like um the tour got called off after manly mm-hmm in 2020, I think it was. Sure. Um, And I don't think I was ready. Like, I honestly don't think I was. Um, The last year that I had off was like the best year I've had in a long time. And I hate to say it because a lot of people really didn't have a good time. Of course. Um, But I learned a lot about myself. I improved my surfing, I think. Um, And yeah, it just made me more prepared. And it kind of feels like I'm not a rookie anymore. Like, it feels like I've done this. I've watched everyone. I've had my year on tour last year and now i'm like okay sweet i'm ready to go it's interesting right because so many world-class talents are essentially on like a train track right you do your amateurs and your pro juniors and your qs's and your photo trips and your sponsor trips and then you try to qualify and then you're on tour and as you said like it's almost it's almost impossible to take a year off right but last year you actually got one so you were able to use it to develop what kind of things did you work on last year just in terms of your surfing or just just outside of surfing um last year when everything got caught off for me like i had all of this like anxious energy just sitting inside me because i was like wow i'm gonna do like i'm gonna compete in my first event at snapper rocks i had like i know my first heat was tyler and steph and i was like this is sick and then when it got caught off i had like so much anxious energy i didn't know what to do with it and Mm. i kind of had to take like two months literally off surfing um which was probably the best thing for me because some people just surf all the time because they absolutely froth but for me like the way that i function is like i just wind myself up in a good way surfing heaps and then like i need a break and a break for me is just doing things i love like hanging out with friends Mm. i did a lot of that um, I was studying, which kept me busy too. Uh, I saw the family heaps because I don't live at home anymore. Um, yeah, just all that fun stuff that you don't really get to do when you're traveling 24, like, yeah, 12 months of the year, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that, that idea of how you function in that it's not every day for me, I need to have these breaks. Is that something you've always known or is it something you discovered throughout kind of your, your amateur junior careers? Um, I always felt the need to like continue like pushing myself past what I thought I needed to. Like uh, I'm always a person, I'm like a perfectionist and I love doing things to the point where it's like, all right, I know I've done absolutely everything that I can because I don't like leaving anything on the table. But I got to a point um, through the QS probably like four years ago where I realized that that's probably not the best mentality for me because for me, like, um, I don't have a spleen and my blood cells are shaped differently. So I don't retain as much oxygen and I get tired really easy. Mm. It's just like genetic thing that I have. Um, so I really need to like listen to my body more. And I think, um, taking breaks when I feel like I have to has been like a lifesaver for me. Mm. And even just like two weeks at a time, I'll be like, I don't really feel like surfing. I'm just going to like cruise. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to literally just like veg out. Right. Yeah. You don't have a spleen. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Was it removed or is that? Um, so through my dad's side of the family, we um, have this thing called spherocytosis, which is a genetic condition that the blood vessel or blood cell is actually a different shape. Mm. So as it filters through the spleen, the spleen has to work like literally 10 times, at 10 times the speed of what a normal person does. So when I was 11, I have a twin sister and literally the exact same day, we both fell sick and we both ended up in hospital. It was freaky. 
and I ended up having my spleen removed and she still has hers at hers is at half half um, functioning capacity mm-hmm. and mine's obviously completely removed. So yeah, it's been interesting. Like obviously a spleen filters your blood cells and it keeps you healthy. Sure, so yeah. just I've just got to be more careful. You know, it hasn't really hindered me too much. But just in the tiredness sense, like I probably can't surf for more than two hours at a time. And then if I do feel tired and lethargic, just to take it easy is like the best thing for me. Otherwise, I get sick pretty easy. Mm. Yeah. And your sister and you, when you fell ill on the same day, were you together? Were you in different parts of the country? Like what was going on? Um, it was, I remember specifically it was grade one photo day. <laughs> she was sick and stayed at home and I went to school. And I got my photos done and everything. Uh, I, if you go back and look at the photos, I literally look like pale white. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty hectic. But I went back to a friend's house and um, I remember sitting down in a chair much like this and I couldn't get up for four hours. And then mum came over to pick me up and she's like, there's definitely something wrong. So um, she took both of us to the hospital. And yeah, my spleen had completely died. Same day. Same day, like. We don't have any of that twin stuff where we can read each other's minds or anything, but you know our spleens just cock it on the same day. I like a hundred years, if that happened like a hundred years before, they'd be like demons. hundred percent witches. Witches. That's right. Burn them. Uh, we could help them, but we're going to burn them at a stake instead. So. Let them suffer. <laughs> That's right. Um, I, that, is, that is absolutely wild. But it's interesting too, because that just the idea of of being very body aware and listening to your body and saying i'm going to design my career my profession my activity around that uh, you know ryan callanan was on the podcast a while back and he was talking about the same thing around his uh, knees that that became uh, i don't remember exactly what the condition was but it was something later in his career where he said i just can't walk you know because wow. of this knee condition and he thought his surfing career was over, but it was this thing where he's like, no, I, you know, I, I went to understand it and went to understand how to treat it, but it's the same thing. And, and he, I, I often quote him on this podcast because he said something I thought was dead on. He goes, surfing's so fun that it's very hard to say no to it. You're like, yeah, I want to go get another wave. I want to have another session. I want to go on a contest and have another trip. And for him, he had to learn just body management to kind of get to where he is now. Right. Um, and I just thought, I just it kind of reminds me of that. Like it's you know, it's not just sort of maybe, maybe we're being presumptive, but like the Italo Ferreira, like he's going to surf 20 hours a day and that's how he becomes world champ. Like it's mm-hmm. not the same for everybody. It's hard too, because you see people like that and you go, man, do I need to be doing all that stuff too? Right. And you need to be mentally strong. In the fact that everyone's journey is different. And that's the thing that I've learned the most too. It's, you don't have to surf 20 hours a day. Like if you surf two hours a day and you put full, like your full concentration into it and you have like a set goal that you want to accomplish in that session, I've learned that you don't need to do more than that. Um, I mean, obviously there's things I do out of the water too that um, also contribute to surfing, like working on um, my mental headspace and stuff, Mm -hmm. stretching, all that kind of, you know, in the gym. So yeah, I mean, surfing just tires me out, but obviously I love it too. It's (laughs) hard because I'm like, yeah, I just want to surf heaps. Um, but I know for me, that's not the best thing for me. So yeah, it's, I didn't know about Ryan. That's, that's a cool story. It's funny. Like, I mean, and I, I, you know, doing this job and you end up working with a lot of sort of XCT surfers as well. And they almost get programmed to surf in 30 minute bursts. Like, Mm -hmm. and I mean, I'm 38. I'm like, well, I've got like a two hour window. I want to surf for two hours and I'll go surf with like Travelogie or Pat O'Connell. And after 30 minutes, they're like, I'm done. That's how I've been programmed. (laughs) It's true. Well, you've got your heat scenarios, which are 30 minutes. And I feel like I've gotten to the point now where it's literally like, my attention span sometimes only lasts 30 minutes. Right, yeah. <laughs> literally. And then after 30 minutes, like I might go out for a free surf and I'll give myself, you know, focus on this for 30 minutes and then you can do whatever the heck you want. Like, sure. Go just enjoy yourself, float, highline, whatever. Yeah. Um. So I, I relate to that. That's cool. It's so true. I feel like I'm already in that headspace. Because of the uniqueness of the 2020-2021 uh, COVID-impacted CT calendar, you know, a lot of the conversation around the tour has been how upended the rankings have been because of the results and the performances, because everything is different. Um, you know, you guys started out at, at Maui. Um, how How is that as sort of an opening event for your rookie season? Maui was at the top of my bucket list on events to go to. Um, so I thought the whole year was a write-off last year and I was really upset that we weren't going to go to Maui, but then obviously the month before it got called on and it literally 
met every wild expectation that I had in my head. Like I got there a week and a half before the contest started and that was, we were like the first people there and it was just like the most surreal place I've ever seen. Like I could, I could probably live over there to be honest. Like I just, it was beautiful. Um, and the whole contest, it was awesome. It was exactly what I imagined. Um, I surfed three heats in one day, didn't exactly get the result that I wanted, but like it was, I felt for me a really good start to like being on tour and obviously you can't be expected to smash your first event because, um, I mean, it's so different to the QS and all those girls are just phenomenal. So, um, it was pretty cool. It was an epic event. And then what we were intending to do was back it up with, you know, Sunset Beach and Santa Cruz and, you know, because of COVID that, that, that was changed. How did you personally pivot with that kind of news? Were you like, well, you know, I, I guess my rookie year is a little bit different or were you really bummed that you didn't surf Sunset in Santa Cruz? I guess my question. <laughs> I like that question. To be honest, it was definitely a shock. Like when we got the call up um, a week before the comp started. But again, like I think the things that 2020 taught me was literally nothing is certain. And I used to be like, I'm a very like, structured person mm. and so change for me is really daunting but after 2020 and everything literally like I had this huge calendar and I had written all of the contests down colored them in and it's still sitting in my living room <laughs> to this day just as a reminder like things aren't set in stone and you need to be able to adapt um but I spent three weeks at sunset surfing it and it was the scariest wave I've ever surfed have you not been there before no the, uh, I have but I never like I've never really like focused on surfing it. Sure. I always go like Rockies or V-Land. Yeah, sure. Me too. I love it. It's a bit more mellow. Like, you know, it's fun. But um, again, that three weeks, I learned so much about myself. Like the first week I progressed from like shoulder hopping, literally paddling out into the channel when I saw like a teeny bump coming to like sitting underneath people and copping sets on the head. And um, yeah, there was one time like I think it was 12 – 14 foot and like uh, there was heaps of people out there and literally I was out there for five minutes and the set of the day comes through lands on my head I bail my board like a cook does, a rookie does like everyone's like don't bail your board like I can't duck dive snap my leg rope um and ended up taking like 20 minutes to swim in but like if that had happened at the very start of like when I started surfing compared to the three weeks later um I would have been petrified at the start so sure. yeah I learned a lot and even after that, as I said, we, we stayed at Sunset for a number of years and I surfed there quite a bit too, no, nothing like that. But similar situations, like when you do take a pounding and you're like, oh, it wasn't as bad as I thought. I thought I was going to die yep. and I'm okay. So the next time you go out there, you're like, oh, it's, it's, I'm not as scared to kind of like sit where I was sort of thing. So 100%. And then everything like outside of Sunset, even like Margaret River when it was big, nothing seems scary compared to it you know what i mean of course so it's it was probably really cool to spend that time over there um i was a little bit nervous about going to santa cruz right yeah um why um i don't know just everything that was going on in at that time that oh point in covid time. related yeah. and pandemic and um the, no, no spleen related to of course yeah. <laughs> um so i was kind of a bit anxious about that so i mean that being called off i wasn't too upset to be sure. to be totally honest um but yeah, I think everything worked out how it was supposed to work out. So I'm happy. Yeah. And um, you said you didn't have expectations of smashing your first event, but you smashed your second one at mm. Newcastle. You uh, made the final and, and trounced a number of the world's best surfers. So, so walk us through that experience. That was surreal. Um, I definitely didn't expect that to happen in my second event on tour. Um, I had my whole family come down. They were there supporting me and um, they've really never come to any contest. So I felt that energy when they were there, which was amazing. And I don't know, I just, I went in going quarters will be cool. Um, my overall goal for the year was just to requalify through the CT. And then I just kept getting through heats, which was cool. I just, I love the place. I love Newcastle. I've been doing the QS for seven odd years now. It's been mm. a long time. So yeah, we have like a 6,000 there every year. And, um, yeah, I just, my boards felt right. My head was right. And I didn't really have any expectations of myself at that point. So um, I was just free. Did you have expectations in there being after <laughs> finally? If you couldn't tell, yeah. <laughs> um, We've really scripted this well. Really. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> I don't know. Narrabeen was um, just, it was hard. Um, going from 
that's super high in Newcastle, having four days to like kind of refocus and mm. then back it up. I was struggling free surfing in Arabian in the first place because it was it's a really hard place for me. Like I don't really I don't feel the vibe. Like right. it doesn't resonate. For me, if I feel at home that that's when I do well. Like mm. Newcastle, I felt at home, like I could live there. Is it the community or the wave that you're talking about when no, you say feel at home? Or both, the, maybe. I don't know. Um it's none I don't think it's any of the above. It's just like having that thing that just makes it feel like I'm at home. Mm, mm. I don't know. I haven't pinpointed what it is, but um, I think maybe even being in the area multiple times and knowing which coffee shop to go to or like yeah. all that, like the community in Narrabeen is amazing. Right. Like I've got a lot of friends who live there. Um, but I think it was also, I set that expectation a little bit, a teeny bit higher <laughs> at Narrabeen. <laughs> and the set, the thought kept popping in my mind. It was like, you don't want to go from making a final to getting last. Right. And I think that kept on repeating in my head. And that was the downfall. Like I was looking for rights when it was a left. Right. So um, I think I just self-sabotaged myself. It's one rogue brain cell in the back of your head that was saying, you don't want to do that. You're like, <laughs> you stay quiet. Everyone else is focused. Like, what? Don't do that. Uh, but do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, as, as hard as that must be for anybody, let alone a rookie, to go from, you know, finals to to not advancing out of a heat in Arabian, you recovered very, very nicely um, when you went out west. And and is that another place, I guess both, right, you know, Margaret River and Rotnest, um, that, that did feel more kind of like home for you? Or how did you kind of reset after Narrabeen, I guess I'm more interested in? Um, after Narrabeen, I was pretty upset for like a decent five days. Like I wasn't, I was just really in my head. Um, yeah, it's hard to even describe because like I just went through a roller coaster of emotions that I'd never been through before mm. in the space of like two weeks. Mm. So I was like trying to come to terms with how to deal with that. And I think the best thing for me was just removing myself from that situation. So I actually ended up going down the coast to Ulladulla. Okay. Um, and just surfing and hanging out with mates and like surfing bigger, bigger, chunkier waves to kind of get used, like get ready for WA, tune my boards in and I think removing myself from that situation was the best thing for me to do. And then obviously WA is like one of my favorite places in the whole world. So as soon as I landed off the plane, I was like, ah, this is home. Like I feel it. I was staying like pretty much in the middle of the rainforest or like the balcony looked out to like just trees. I'm like, I like this. <laughs> <laughs> and it was huge. Margaret River was huge this year. It was big. Yeah. It was definitely daunting. Um, the first day when they put the chicks out and it was meant to get to like 15 foot. I'm not going to lie. I was a little bit scared. I was like, because I was like one of the last heats of the round before the boys were put on. And I was like, I know it's picking up today. Like, this is kind of scary. And it was crazy. Like I surfed in the morning and it wasn't too big. Um, and I ended up getting stuck on the inside and I bailed my board as you do. I should have learned, but I don't. <laughs> and it ended up snapping on me. Um, one of my favorite boards, but I heard something funny like that whole day. It was so big. I was the only person that snapped a surfboard that day. In the free surf? No, the whole day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like even when it was like six, 15, 16 foot. <laughs> like how does that work? Lucky you. <laughs> oh, stoked. But um, How's that swim in? I had the jet ski there. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> I've done the swim in from Margs before. That's a long one. It's not as bad as Sunset, but it's definitely not as easy as other places. Sure. So. Sure. Do you ever think about sharks when you're in Western Oz? I'm more scared about the waves, to be honest. Yeah. I, I come from a place um, on the Sunshine Coast called Coolan Beach. Mm -hmm. So I've grown up from like, when did I move there? I moved there when I was like two or three, but I started surfing when I was like 11. Yeah. So from 11 to like 18, 19, I just surfed like this beach break and it probably never got over two foot. <laughs> so like every time I like surf a reef break or something that has a bit of like substance or power, it's just not familiar to me. No matter how many times I go and try and so like make myself accustomed to surfing those waves, it's always like that little voice in the back of the head going, this is scary. <laughs> um, but sharks never really come into the picture for me. Like we have such good um, shark surveillance, mm -hmm. like on tour. They've been amazing. Like three skis, four skis, like the drone. It's, you yeah. don't even think about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I want to get dive into where you did come from, but first we're going to take a quick break to get a word in from our sponsors. So you learned to surf on the Sunshine Coast, but you were not born there. You were actually born in Denmark. I was, yes. Um, I was born in a little town called Helsom over there. And yeah, I think 
obviously I moved over when I was two, but yeah, mum spoke Danish to us all the time and um, I've still got like probably 80% of that language in me. I can understand like 90% and, um, but it's funny, like I, I would go there after the Spain contest right. and I would have like a whole year would have gone by and I would have forgotten how to speak it. And then I kind <laughs> of like relearn it again and then like the whole cycle goes again. <laughs> but yeah, it's probably my favorite place in the whole world. Denmark. Do you still have family over there? Yep. Half my family. My mom's side lives over there. Um, my granddad's over there. He's probably one of the coolest people that you ever meet. You want to give him a shout out in, in their native tongue? Hi, Morfa. You sound and I. You hope I do it good. Yeah. Can you say welcome to the lineup? I'm <laughs> welcome to the lineup. That works. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, mom spoke Danish to us until we were like six or seven, maybe eight. And I, I listened to Connor's podcast the other day on the way up to the ranch, actually. And it was funny because I resonated with the fact that, like, you know, it's not cool, like, or you don't think it's cool personally, like, to have dual citizenship and be, like, half-half, like, half Danish, half Australian. And I remember getting to that point when I was, like, 10 or 11 when you're like, Mom, stop talking to me in Danish. That's not <laughs> cool, you know? Like, my friends are looking at me funny. And so that's when she kind of stopped. And I kind of, like, really regret that because I – like right like the last six or seven years i've really like cherished that side of me yeah and it's a big part of who i am like scandinavian yeah it's so funny because um you know my mom wasn't i mean i I grew up in america my mom's australian and she used to dress me in like you know public school clothes for australia and i'd go get my ass kicked at public school in america and it was the same thing where like everyone's just trying to fit in but every everyone even if like you know, they're third generation, both parents are Australian or American, like has that, like they have a heritage, Mm. but everyone's just got this weird hive mind of like, I want to be the same as everyone else. And I think everyone has that regret of like, I don't know why I thought that. Like, I think, you know, you don't know any different as a kid. Of course. And like, yeah, you can't hold yourself accountable for that. Like as a kid, you're influenced by so many different things and it, your parents are like, the biggest influence I reckon until you're like 10 and then from then on like you know your friends really influence you mm-hmm. obviously your parents as well but you know you always want to fit in and like you don't want to be that outcast misfit like weirdo who is di- not weirdo but the, the one who's different sure yeah. is the thing that I'm trying to say but yeah I just it's hard like a lot of people go for it like you said even like the people who have lived there for three generations like it's all the same really yeah no totally and you mentioned a twin sister yes that's exciting it's very cool. Um, my twin sister, Helena, she actually lives in London now. She's a paramedic. Oh, wow. She moved over, I'd say, four months before the pandemic hit. So she's been busy. She's been really busy. Um, she moved over with her partner and I haven't seen her for two years. Oh, wow. So it's been sad, but I mean, distance makes the heart grow fonder. So I can't wait to see her. But yeah, I mean, growing up, obviously, if you've had siblings or you have siblings, you know how it is. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, we used to fight heaps. She'd steal my clothes. She'd clock me on the back of the head as I'm sitting on the couch and like run into the bathroom and lock the door so I couldn't get her. It's <laughs> a good move. Oh, yeah, yeah. She was smart. Um, but as I moved out of home when I was 18, mm-hmm. like we started to get along really well and she's like my best friend. Did she surf as well growing up or was that just a Isabella thing? We are literally like the total different, a total different person. I'm like... She's probably a head shorter than me, maybe half a head shorter than me. Really? Brown hair, brown eyes. And like she was a full girly girl growing up and I was like the full tomboy, like <laughs> knee length board shorts. Yeah, yeah. Um, just loved sport. And she tried surfing, like she can longboard, but it got to that point too, you know how like we're talking about when you're a kid, you're very self-conscious about what people think. Yep. And I think she just, yeah, wasn't really into it and didn't want people to judge her for you know, trying something new. So she just kind of went her own way, which is cool because like I reckon if we probably both were competitive surfers, it would be hard. There's kind of, yeah, and I kind of always wonder like, you know, the Hobgoods are notorious for like, you know, coming to blows all the time, like growing up because I, like I have twins. I've got a boy girl. Oh, really? Yeah, they're seven. Amazing. And I always like marvel at like the nature nurture thing because yeah. I kind of think they were like fully formed little people like right away they had their own deal but then they're very different right because they've kind of like there's a symbiotic kind of relationship of like well I'm going to do this which means that kind of takes all of that so you're going to do this kind exactly. of thing and yeah you kind of don't want to be like them 
you love them, but you don't want to be the same. Yeah, of course. Um, I think that's where it went for us. But yeah, we've always, like always been different. She's totally different to me. Um, Did you guys have any other siblings? Or I have a younger brother. He's oh, nine. Okay. He's nineteen. He 19, surfs. Okay. He's living the dream right now. Is Moved he? out of home. He's um, hopefully, if the snowfields open up, he's going to go work at Falls Creek down in Victoria. Oh, cool. So, um, yeah, I mean, in another lifetime, I'd love to live his life. <laughs> sure. He's having a good time. <laughs> well, that's the, it's always the younger sibling that has like the like, well, I know what not to do and I know what worked because they've got the guidance of the older siblings to look at. Yeah, I think he looked at me and my sister and went, yeah, no, I'm going to try and be different. <laughs> I'm going to just, yeah, keep my mouth shut and, you know, go do my own thing. <laughs> it's funny. I mean, everyone's got a fairly unique story, but a lot of the surfers that make it to the elite level, as we kind of talked about, they're, they're kind of on a train track where it's there's the industry and the media and the sport itself kind of set up like this is the matriculation process. But um, even just in getting to know you in, in the last few days and, and having followed your story a bit, yours is quite a departure from a lot of people in the sense of, you know, your pursuit of education and, and, and things like that. So I was wondering if you can talk about that a little bit, the decision to both pursue a championship tour career, but also an education. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I feel like there's been a stereotype with surfers for a long time that we're not smart. Mm hmm. Um, but that's not the case because there's so many intelligent surfers now. I know a lot of studying um, and I think COVID's really brought that on. Like everyone had time to kind of find themselves and do something different. But through school, like I loved maths and science and physics and never English. Like I was never really good with words, but I always knew I wanted to do something in that field. Mm. And I didn't really know what it was. Um, and I had a really good physics and math teacher and he kind of like obviously with engineering – it's so like gender biased. There's like 90% men and 10% women. Mm -hmm. So he really like nurtured, like there was five of us girls and he was like, you guys should like try get into engineering. I was like, that's a really good idea. Like I like mass physics. It kind of ticks all the boxes. So I enrolled straight after school. Um, and then obviously doing the QS, it's a hard slug. You can't, it's hard to study and then also travel. Sure. Um, so I put on hold for four years and then I found a university that let me do it online, which mm. was amazing. And then it was around that time where I like had a little bit of a epiphany. I was like, I want to link the two together in a sense where, um, I want to have that mass and physics side, but also keep the surfing side too. Mm. And this was around the time when wave pools started booming. Right. So, um, you know, there was one going down up in Melbourne, you know, the one up in North Queensland, obviously Kelly's pool. Sure. Um, and I was like, I really want to get into like designing and building wave pools. Um, and I haven't really gotten too far into the degree, into the degree where I like really know what's going on, but I've done like the maths and physics behind it. And then now it's just a process of learning more about actually building and designing pools. So it's really exciting. And we're here, we're recording this at Surf Ranch. So this will come out after you've likely won the event. Um, but you haven't gotten your hands on the tech here yet, have you? Not yet, but I think literally right after this podcast, um, I'm going to get a tour of the facility. I'm going to see how it all works and going to get the inside secrets, you know, all that fun stuff. So, it. Increase the frequency of the waves for us. It'll be great. 100%. <laughs> um, so I'm really looking forward to that. Was it daunting kind of making that decision to do university in terms of like, well, is this going to sap too much time away from my my surfing career or anything like that? To be totally honest, the year that I made the decision to study was the year where I gave myself one more year in the QS mm. because um, I, was, I won the World Juniors. Yep, and 2015, then right? 2015, yep. yep. So long ago now. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think it was like two years ago and then I'd clock it and I'm like, oh, it's six. Crazy, I'm like, hey. Yeah. I'm like getting old now. <laughs> But yeah, I did that. And then I had three really bad years in the QS. Um, mentally, I wasn't there. Mentally, I was doubting myself. I'm like, oh, you know, like obviously after winning that, you're like, the expectation is so same high. Same thing, right? Yeah. Um, same thing as, yeah, the last few events. But anyway, I was like, I need to change something. Like this isn't working for me, whatever I'm doing. I may as well like try something different. Mm. Um, so I was like, I'll try studying, you know, we'll see how it goes. At least if I don't qualify this year, I will have something that I've already started working on right. that I can transition into. Like you're not doing something cold where you're like I've, I've kind of overlap them a little bit. Yeah, overlap them. So I've already adjusted to one, and like 
Yeah, I literally was like, if I don't qualify, I probably am not going to do this anymore. And then I started studying um, a week before Newcastle and I made my first six-star final in Newcastle and then I backed it up with um, another second place in Manly <laughs> straight after it. And I was like, wow, this actually kind of works. Yeah, maybe you needed to study. Maybe maybe you should have done that sooner. Maybe, maybe I should maybe have that's in hindsight. What was working. Yeah. Hindsight's a... Oh, I reckon you timed it perfectly, but I'm just saying like, it sounds like it actually helped in terms does. of focus. I think um, with me, like I have a very anal analytical brain where... I didn't have anything feeding it like the oil I was getting rusty my brain right. was getting rusty and like I was making silly mistakes like dropping in on people and doing dumb stuff that I shouldn't be doing that I know I shouldn't be doing but um I think just studying it kind of like was that oil can mm. pouring over my brain like right. de-rusting it a little bit and um at least now like once I had that other thing I was focusing on I didn't like base my whole self-worth off my surfing results mm -hmm. which kind of lifted a bit of the pressure making that decision to pursue an education did that come up with your sponsors at all did they have thoughts or opinions on that when you um i didn't that? didn't really get them involved in the decision i thought it was just um more for me yeah, um sure. and it wasn't going to affect anything that i was doing in regards to them sure or my surfing because surfing was always my first priority yeah and obviously if i had an exam or something that would be the only reason why it would get in the way um but I started working with a lovely lady at Surfing Australia called Michelle Mitchells, who mm -hmm. they've brought her in now as a career guidance, like oh, wow. counselor for people either exiting the sport or like doing what I'm doing, studying. And so she really guided me and helping me with what you need to choose. And it made the process a lot easier, which yeah. was amazing. And now I know like there's at least they've gotten like seven or eight people into uni now through that program, which is amazing. And I'd like to think too that um, if I were a sponsor that had, you know, a young talented surfer that was doing very well, um, both on the QS and qualifying on the CT and doing well on the CT, and they were also studying academically, I'd actually be pretty psyched. Like, and I'd, I'd maybe try to figure out a way to tap into that in a way because it goes into relatability, right? Like so many people go through the matriculation of education um, and just kind of makes people more, more dimensional, I think, in a way. Yeah, I agree. I mean, these days the surfing industry, they want di like points of difference too. Yeah. Um, so I feel like that was a point of difference and I feel like it's been really good for me to study. Yeah, because it is that point of difference. And I didn't really know like, you know, at the start of your career, you're like, what am I going to be? Like, what kind of pathway am I going to lead? Mm. You know, and I felt like I feel like I finally found my pathway and that is education. And um. Yeah, and you don't know where it's going to lead to, and so I'm really excited. It is really cool with the advent of, um, you know, online schooling getting so much better because like 15 or 20 or 30 years ago, it was kind of probably what you were faced with early on, which people are saying, well, you can't not come to school and get an education, but now you can. So it kind of doesn't matter if you're traveling or not. So easy. Honestly, yeah. I um, I study at a university called Deakin. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually down based down in Victoria. Okay. Um, but we have this thing called cloud campus where I literally can take my work anywhere with me and it's uploaded to the web. Like I can do it at my own pace. And obviously I have a time limit where I have to have it handed in by, but you know, if I have a contest for a week and I don't really feel like doing anything, then I can just kind of put it to the side for a little bit, come mm. back to it, all that kind of stuff. I love it. Yeah. Well, we're going to bring it back to the, uh, the present and the future, but we're going to take one more break to get another word in from our sponsors. Now, I know you don't think about sharks, or you didn't say you think about sharks, but you did stunt double for Blake Lively in The Shallows, which was all about sharks. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the experience of just stunt doubling. That industry, the movie industry, is the most interesting one that I've ever been into. Obviously, um, I went over to Lord Howe Island, which is about 700 kilometers off Port Macquarie mm. in New South Wales. And I was over there for three weeks. I actually got the call up. I think Surfing Australia got a call up saying, hey, we need a stunt double. Um, Blake's this height, um, you know, her hair is this long, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and they're like, oh, okay, we have someone who kind of fits that profile. And I went and like auditioned. I went in for 10 minutes, all right, all right, sweet. And then I got a call up about two weeks later going, hey, we want you to come to Lord Howe and like shoot with Blake and surf and hang out. I'm like, this is like trippy because – I grew up watching Gossip Girl and Age, Age of Adeline and she literally like was or is my favorite actress. So I was like, I must be dreaming right now. This is so surreal. 
So um, literally three weeks before I finished year 12, I jumped on a plane to Lord Howe and I was waking up at four o'clock every morning, riding my bike because this it's like an island. It's exactly like Rottnest. There's mm-hmm. no cars and you'd be riding your bike with a head torch at 4 a.m. in the morning trying to dodge birds on this road. Um, and I think I probably worked four days out of three weeks mm-hmm. just surfing wise. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was incredible. Like I got dots on my face and they like used, I don't even know what the technology is, CGI or whatever yeah, yeah. to put her face onto mine <laughs> as I was surfing. But, um, I got to meet her, hang out with her. I'd sit in like the makeup trailer and hang out with her and her kid and just banter. Um, I taught her how to paddle properly, like <laughs> all the parts of the surfboard. And I don't know that three weeks was the most surreal three weeks of my life. Um, but going back to like how crazy that industry is, you'd literally, literally rock up the next morning and they ha- would have already fired someone and another person would be over there. Right. Um, so I was like, wow, this is like so different to what I know. Um, obviously, given the opportunity, I probably would do it again. Mm. But um, I'm going to stick with the industry that I'm in. Right, right, right. <laughs> but yeah, that was surreal. And obviously it was a shark movie, but they didn't have any like, it was all CGI as well. They had sure. a little shark fin that they would like motorize and like <laughs> film. Um, I watched the movie once because I don't really like watching myself on TV or anything. Sure. It's like, oh, that's cool. I don't need to watch it again. Um, and as a surfer, you look at it and you go, that's pretty corny. Right. Um, but it's cool just to like see, hey, that's me, you know, like. Well, and I mean, Hollywood has a fraught relationship with surfing, like yeah. at best, like. I don't know. What do you think is the best surfing movie, the most accurate and fair surfing movie that you've seen out of Hollywood? I can't even say. I don't know. <laughs> I think do you sur- have any Surf's Up with the Penguins is my... I, I, I actually agree. I feel yeah. like a surfer wrote and directed that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's probably one of my favorite movies too. So. It's a good movie. It's a great movie. I, everything else is sort of like... <laughs> and you're like, ah, oh, you know. I felt the same with that one, but it was a really cool experience and... Um, it's funny because that whole island, it's not known for like sharks. Like there's never really been any happenings there. But a week after we left, there was two scuba divers that went missing off the island. And supposedly there was like a, a, like a shark hanging around too. So we were like, oh, that's eerie. Like, is that like, yeah. Yeah. That's like Crazy. a weird, um, it's weird poltergeist filming vibes. Exactly. Like when they did the poltergeist movie and then everyone... Had it weird things happen. I can't say that I've ever watched that movie, That's but okay. I'm going to say, yeah, 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 yeah. I live under a rock when it comes to like um, movie history, music history, surfing history. So I'm just super naive. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh, you should watch it though. It's a good movie. Poltergeist. Yeah. Heard about just, it, yeah. You know, watch it like um, at night when you're alone. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a horror? Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't like horror movies. This this brings me to my topic du jour. I'm glad we're going. We're going to go down the avenue here because uh. I've been obsessed a few weeks ago, uh, the New Yorker magazine in, in America released a, a story on UFOs and basically saying the Pentagon acknowledges that it does not know what these things are. Really? Um, they call them unidentified aerial phenomena, UAPs, because they're rebranded. Stop it. But this is this is wild. So like for decades, they've spent tens of millions of dollars studying this stuff, but they didn't want to talk about it or say they didn't know what it was because of the Russian Cold War. And they're like, we don't want to tell the Russians we don't know what this is. So we're going to say it's we don't know what it is. So anyway, long story short, I've been asking everyone in my life whether they believe in ghosts or UFOs or both. So I'm going to ask you. And if you believe in one more than the other. This is really hard because I have a lot of friends who have said that they have seen ghosts and believe in them. Mm. But I never have. Mm-hmm. And I'm a very seeing is believing kind of person. Of course. So, Mechanical engineer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, sometimes to a fault really. But um, I'm going to say no to ghosts. I, you know what? I think there is like spirits out there, but I wouldn't necessarily call them ghosts. Like, And I wouldn't say that they come and haunt people and do all that. But UFOs, I reckon, yeah. I reckon not necessarily like the picture that we have in our mind of like, big discs with aliens flying on it but there's definitely something going on mm. yeah i believe in that okay i appreciate your answer i like it I <laughs> what like about it. you 
Oh, I someone I heard someone on like a podcast say they believed in ghosts and not UFOs, and I literally lost my shit. I'm like, how do you believe in that before the other thing? Yeah. Like, I just I go back to the like the universe is essentially mathematically infinite. Yeah, it would be like the height of egoism to believe we're the only thing in it. Exactly, right? I, so I I agree. I I kind of start there. I had a ghost experience once in New York, but I'm not like a ghost person. Okay, so. I feel like once I have that experience, like I'm sure I will, then I'll be like, I'll come back to you and be like, hey, I'm going to change my answer. <laughs> That's to, well, you're welcome back on the pod. Yeah. If you do that, we will only talk about that. I, I'm down for that. <laughs> right, I'm looking out for it. <laughs> we're, we're, as I said before, we're, we're switching gears in a big way. We're, we're here at Surf Ranch. Um, you've not been here before. By the time this comes out, the event would have happened. What has been your experience just being here for the first time? I coming here the two weeks leading up I was so excited I was like a kid at a candy store going this is gonna be sick like I've surfed the wave pool at Melbourne I had the best time I'm gonna be totally honest I've had a really hard time trying to figure this wave out um it's definitely not what you see on tv it's not as easy as it looks I've been watching heaps of footage I'm like okay all you need to do is just like two turns here barrel two like three turns four turns and the pace at which the wave moves at like I literally took off my first wave, did a turn and I got caught behind already. Mm. And I was like, this is a sick way to start, like <laughs> sick. Um, so it's been really hard, but obviously when you complete a wave, you feel super satisfied. Um, I've heard everyone saying this is the most nerve wracking event on tour. Mm. And I've always been like, oh yeah, you know, now I understand it's definitely bloody nerve wracking. Um, I already get nervous just waiting for like, they do a call, it's like, P uh, C T three thirty seconds, and you sit there in the water and you're just looking like staring down at the train, going, "When are you gonna move?" <laughs> and you learn a lot about yourself in that thirty seconds between like them saying it and then the train moving. Um, so I've just learned like I'm trying to like find ways to calm the nerves down, whether that be breathing or like singing "Twinkle Twinkle Little Star" to myself in my head or out loud. Um, so it's been hard, but also a really exciting experience just in the sense that I love a good challenge and I'm ready for it. Like I've got four more waves this afternoon and then the contest starts tomorrow. So I've got time. I feel like my board's good. Um, I'm in a good headspace. It took me a little while. The first training day I was mm. a little bit frazzled, a little bit emotional, um, but yeah, I'm ready now. Have you done anything different with your boards for this wave in particular? Or? Um. Yeah, so Darren made them a little bit shorter, mm -hmm. a little bit lighter. Um, I'm not necessarily an epoxy person and people have been telling me that epoxies go well here. Mm. But the limited amount of waves that we get to warm up, I'm like, I'm not going to change something that drastically um, because it probably just wouldn't be super beneficial. But yes, yeah, so we've made them shorter, lighter. Um, I've stuck to round tails, which is good. Like I'm a rounded square to round tail kind of person, depending on what the waves are like, but I've just stuck to round tails. Um, I just feel like they pivot easier and I'm just, I feel like I'm a back footed surfer as well. So it kind of, it works well. Excellent. And looking forward at the balance of the season. So after Surf Ranch, we're going back to Barra de la Cruz. We haven't been there since 2006. I don't think the women have ever competed there, but there's probably a, a lot of similarities in terms of sand bottom right hand point and the experience you've had on the Gold Coast. Uh, and then Tahiti, and then the WSL finals. Yes. How how are you viewing that that segment of events? How do you rate your chances in Mex and Tahiti, and then and then uh, potentially cracking the top five for the finals? Um, good question. I I'm super excited for Mexico. I've seen video footage of it, and it looks like one of the best waves in the whole world. So like coming into these two events, like the Surf Ranch in Mexico, I've just been like super excited, just frothing. Um. And so hopefully, like, obviously we've got Snapper. I grew up surfing um, Noosa Point, all the points. So um, right-hand sand bottom point breaks are, like, just my dream. I feel like I just get that grom froth every time I, like, go surf a sand bottom right-hander. So, yeah, I'm excited. Um, Tahiti, interesting. Um, I'm a little bit nervous. Um, Have you been there before or? I've surfed Chopu when I was like 16, 17. I went over for a pro junior and surfed, um, I don't even know what. Little... Uh, the Papara was for the pro junior? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Papara, yeah, yeah that's yeah. it. And we went and surfed Chopes and it was scary because it was like three foot. So when it's smaller, it kind of like, it comes onto the reef a little bit more. So it's more shallow. 
And I definitely was shoulder hopping the whole time. <laughs> um, but I feel like it's going to be a cool challenge in the same way that this, the surf ranch is a good challenge because like I'm not used to it. I'm not comfortable with it. But if I need a result, like I know I'm going to step up and like throw myself over the ledge because that's just what we have to do. And that's, that's the profession that we're in. I don't want to go over there and not try. There is a weird dissonance at Chopes, like you said. Like it could be three feet, but in your brain, like the West Bowl still looks like the West Bowl. And you're like, I think yeah. that's like an eight foot backless monster. And you still kind of have that. And it still throws a punch, as you said, especially because it's right on the reef. Yeah. So I'm, um, I'm looking forward to it, but I'm also nervous. So um, those two, like it's going to be like a roller coaster of emotions again, like this event. Um, but it's cool. Like I, I kind of used to like run away from all those anxiety emotions. Um, when I'm scared, I used to like just put my head in the sand and like block my ears and go la 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 la. But now I'm like opening up to being more aware of my emotions and I actually enjoy the anxiety. Well, where would, when you say you would run away, what would you do? Like, would you just be like a um, avoidance. Yeah, yeah. Um, avoid doing things that may help me mm. um, for those certain spots. Yeah. Um, pretend that it's not going to happen, all that kind of stuff. Sure. But now I'm like, all right, like the anxiety kind of makes me a human, you know, and I like feeling emotions. This year we're determining the world title via the Rip Curl WSL Finals. It's going to be at Lower Trestles this year and we'll, we'll move the venue around in, in the future years. Unique format. Uh, seed number five serves against seed number four. The winner serves against seed number three. The winner serves against seed number two. And then the winner of that serves against seed number one in best two or three for the world title. Uh, Carissa Moore is having a fantastic year this year, uh, presuming she is in the number one spot. If you make the top five, where do you want to be? Second, third, fourth, or fifth, and why? Good question. Um I think obviously there's perks to being like number one because you only have to serve three times. But I like the fact of like actually having a run up mm. into the final. Um, if I were to make it, hypothetically, I probably would like to be number three. <laughs> um, that would mean you would only have to surf four or five heats, mm -hmm. four heats if you take out two of the finals. Yep. Um, is that right? I'd hate yeah, because you'd have, you'd have, you know, you think you're right because you'd have to surf if you're three. You have to surf against the winner of five and four, so that's one. You have to surf against two, and then you have to at least surf twice against the number one, yeah. so four to five. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like that's that might be too many heats in a day because it's only run on one day, right? Yes, yeah, so a six hour window. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, but coming up against Carissa, you want to be informed too because mm -hmm. if you only surf one heat before it, like she's so good that she can adapt so quickly. So sure. I'd say number three. I feel like that would give you a bit of a better of a chance. If you're number four or five, there's probably too many heats to surf yeah. in one day, Yeah, which is, I guess, the whole reason of the format. Like the one who, the people who are up further have more of a opportunity because they're not going to be as tired. Right. But I'm going to lock in number three. I like it. I, 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 I'm with you. I think number three is the spot. We, we actually were having this conversation a few times. We had it last week with Kanoa, but it was like we agreed that maybe number two is the worst spot. Yep. Because you're sitting at almost at the end of the runway. So someone has all this momentum when they hit you. Exactly. But you only get one crack at it as opposed to like the number one seed's got like best two out of three. So Yeah, that's tough. Yeah. I don't know. Like I definitely wouldn't, wouldn't want to be number five. Sure. Um, well, maybe maybe five's not that bad because four is probably the one you don't want, right? Because five, you're like, well, I'm just happy to be here. That is true. Four's got to do the same work as five. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. I would rather be, yeah, I'd rather be, wait. Three. Yeah, I'd rather be five than, than four, four because yeah. you're right. You do surf the same amount of heats. And then you're obviously like, oh, like I'm coming in as an underdog. Like I'm, I've got the least, like not amount of chance, but like. I'm the least expected to succeed in that instance. Sure. So yeah. the pressure might be a little bit less. And that's, for me, like, that's a big thing. But, you know, all those top guys and girls, they really don't care about all that stuff. Like, they can just, oh. No, no, no. I, no I, I'm glad. Keep going. I like you saying Well, I feel like a lot of those girls who are in the top five have been on tour for so long that the anxiety and the stress, they kind of, it fuels them in a way. Mm. Um, whereas I've me just coming on, like, I'm still learning the ropes. So you would agree that there's a even on tour, right? And maybe you can say this for both the men's and the women's tour, there's a level difference between those sort of top, top seeds and the rest of the field. Definitely. Um, I feel like the top seeds, obviously there's the anxiety of trying to fight for the world title and be the best in the world. 
But looking from the outside, I've never been in that position. But for me, like fighting for your spot on tour mm. is probably more stressful mm. because like those girls, they're set. They know where their future is at. Like they don't have to worry because they know they're that good. That they're that good that they can just get through some heats and you know stay on tour. Whereas I would say the bottom half, it's stressful because like every heat that you lose, you're like, damn, like that could potentially mean that I'm not going to be on tour next year. And the pay difference between the QS and the CT is so significant right. um, that you know it could really like, yeah, it's hard to mentally overcome. I think falling off tour and coming back on, but. A lot of people have done it, like Ethan and Connor as well. Sure. Yeah. Um, so it can be beneficial in a way to realize that, yeah, I don't know. It's it's a tricky one. It's tricky. Well, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. We put out a call for questions to the Instagram community, and we got so many, but we, we've narrowed them down to three. Nice. So three questions from the Instagram community. The first one is from Nina underscore Cassell, who asks, what age do you think is a good age to try and qualify for the championship tour? That's a really good question. And I'm not going to be able to answer that as specifically as she would like me to because um, going back to what we were talking about before, I think everyone's different. Like you've got your Caroline Marks who qualifies at, was she 15? Very young, 16, yeah, somewhere. Um, and that's cool because she can handle that. Like she's an absolute weapon. She's still super young. But for me at that age, like – I almost qualified at 18 and I wasn't ready myself. Mm. Um, so I think it really depends on like how you feel. Like obviously people start surfing later than most or earlier than some. Um, if I were to pick an ideal age, I would want to have more maturity, I think, um, just so I know what I'm coming into and I can deal with the emotions a little bit better. So I'd say maybe like 21 is a really right. good age. Yeah. Obviously I was 23. Um, I obviously was trying to qualify earlier than that, um, but I'd say around 21 is yeah. a really good age because by then I feel like you've mentally developed to a point where you can handle a lot of stress. Right. Yeah. That's a great answer. Second question is from Sergio Sangraman who asks, do you think we will see females start to invest more in doing airs? We already are seeing that. Um, all your Sierra Kerrs and like she's incredible. I've she is been seeing some of the stuff yeah. that she's been doing. There's so many other girls that age too that are just absolutely killing it. Um, and it's kind of scary because I'm like here going, like I, I want to start trying them. Like I have started trying them, but I'm not super confident with them. Um, but when you see girls like that, they're not that young. I mean, they're not that – they're young, but they're coming up quickly. Like she's sure. 16. She'll be on tour soon. Yeah. So we're going to have to find that point of difference or I'm going to have to start doing airs, I guess. <laughs> but we're already seeing the girls doing airs. I think it's just a matter of them feeling confident enough to bring it into heats. Yeah. Final question that we've uh, called from the Instagram community. Mitch underscore MCD89 asks, how has training with Takesh from Surfflow improved your performance in the water? I love that question. Um, <laughs> Takesh, I've been working with him for like three years now. And... I think the main thing for me, like we were talking about, is I'm very rigid in the way that I do things, like very formatted, and he's really helped me. We do this thing called Surf Flow where it's just like I think he's mixed like capoeira with like a few other things that he's brought along from his experiences traveling, and it's just like flow movement. It's almost like a dance, but we do this partner work where like you have to move in sync with someone but you have to be, you have to keep the creativity and an open mind, almost like you do on a wave where like, I used to be like, all right, I'm going to do a snap and then a carve or something, even if the wave doesn't allow that. Right. Whereas he's helped me open my mind to like the creative side because I don't feel like I'm very creative, mm. but he's opened that avenue where it's like not having the exact turn that I want to do in my head before I do it, but just being aware of like what the section is presenting. Mm. And just being more flexible around, like I'm, it's been really fun. Like we do rolls and flips and all that kind of stuff. And um, it just brings a level of difference instead of just like, you know, like obviously gym training is super, super important. And I um, have an amazing trainer, Joe Parsonage at home, who trains me amazingly. And then also pairing that with that creative side is, it's helped me heaps. Like I think I started working with him around the time that I started doing well as well. Like right. just a few different things that I implemented that helped me just overall, just those like five percenters. So I think 
It's helped me with my creativity. Good question. That's a great answer. I'm going to check that out. Final segment, we have the lightning round, Eek. which you said you didn't study for. Uh, Ten questions. Yep. And you can answer as fast as you can. Or as slow as I can. Whatever you like. Okay, yeah, that's the, technically, that's still as fast <laughs> as you can. Whatever you like. First question. If you could only have one board set up for the rest of your life, single fin, twin fin, thruster, quad, bonzer, or finless, which would you choose? Twin fin. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Burrito or pizza? Burrito. Last book you read? Oh, I'm actually reading an investing book at the moment about stocks and stuff because I want to learn about it. Wonderful. Yeah, super fun. <laughs> super exciting. <laughs> Best surf film ever? Uh, Nike 6.0. Hmm. One wave you never have to go back to? <sighs> Oceanside. <laughs> if you only get to surf one wave for the rest of your life? Lakey Peak. Best person to share the lineup with? Um, my dad. Worst person to share the lineup with? My dad, because he gets all the waves. <laughs> Last one. Finish this sentence. I will next achieve a state of happiness by... Believing in myself and doing what makes me happy. Wonderful. Isabella Nichols, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Good luck in the Surf Ranch event. Good luck in the rest of the season. And we'll look forward to seeing you at the finals. Thank you so much for having me. I had a great time. 